Hey guys, it's uh, it's it's been a while. I do have a legitimate reason for taking a break from the channel for so long, but of the many things that I did through my summer break, I learned one major thing that I think will drastically help my actual life career, and that is programming. I learned how to code in more than one language, and more related to this video, how to make video games. Now, I'm no expert in any sense of the word, and there's so much about game development that I have absolutely no idea about, but that's exactly why I want to take this upon myself, to learn more about development as a whole. And that's why I'm going to attempt to make a sonic physics engine with Godot, my game engine of choice, and probably the only one that won't destroy my computer. Without further ado, let's begin. A little disclaimer before we dive into the engine, you may have noticed I specifically said I will be making my own physics engine, which means that my Sonic won't move the exact same way Classic Sonic does. Now why is this a problem? Surely recreating Sonic's physics exactly can't be that hard to find. Well, on the Sonic Retro website there is a Sonic physics guide which has excellent documentation on every aspect of Sonic's physics, but there's a lot to it ground speed, ground angle, air speed, water speed, jump velocity, and all the calculations that go into it, yeah, no. I couldn't even understand it even if I tried, and making custom physics will help me understand more of how Godot works either way. So I'm not remaking the classic Sonic engine. And one last thing, I would like to give a huge shout out to Y, who is also learning Godot, and is the main inspiration behind the series. You should totally check out his series on how he's recreating Super Mario World and try to emulate the feel exactly, and he's miles better at coding than me. I'll link his playlist in the description, but that's enough stalling, so let's actually get into the video. After creating a new project and naming it Sonic 3, I'm going to organize our files into 5 folders. Assets for things like sprites and tom maps, music for level music, scenes which will be explained later, scripts for handling how scenes behave and interact, and sound effects for, well, sound effects. So let's start off by creating a sonic controller, for as simple of a task as that is, but let's set up our player scene. For a brief explanation, any group of nodes strung together to make a system is a scene. What's a node though? Everything in Godot is a node with very explicit descriptions to show exactly what they do. If we need a character body node that is specialized to allow us to manipulate things like player velocity, gravity, and movement, well, here's your character body 2D. Need an animating sprite node that is fine-tuned to allow you to import sprites with excellent splicing, changing frame rates, and more? Well, here's our animated sprite 2D. Need to be able to collide with other objects? Collision shape 2D. And all these come together to make a scene in Godot. And once you make one, you can literally paste it anywhere in the project and it'll work regardless. After grabbing the Sonic 3 sprites from Spriter's resources, I added Sonic's animations for his idling sprite, his walking sprite, his running sprite, and his jump sprite. I also didn't manually speed up the animations in the animated sprite 2D node, and we'll get to that later. But enough beating around the bush, let's actually start coding. I started off by organization and declaring all the variables I'd need for basic moving and jumping. On the Sega Genesis, the game movement runs by pixels per frame, or more specifically, subpixels per frame. 256 subpixels on the Genesis is equal to 1 pixel, and since Sonic's maximum speed on normal terrain in Sonic games is 6 pixels per frame, and the game runs at 60 FPS, we can easily multiply the two numbers to get 360 pixels a second, which is exactly how Godot runs movement in pixels per second. But the max speed Sonic can reach is about the only similarity between real Sonic 3 and my Sonic 3, since again, I'm not trying to understand everything going on here. So I added a float number for my max speed variable for anything that I will multiply my max speed variable for. That way, if I later on want to add a speed shoe monitor and say double the speed of Sonic, I don't need to change max speed to 720. I can just change the max speed float variable to 2 and the game will handle the rest for me. We add the same attributes to my acceleration, deceleration, and my fast deceleration variables. Afterwards, I decided to make physics booleans. 
how these will work is that every action that Sonic can do, either being in his idle animation, moving, or jumping, is all locked behind a boolean that, again, I get to choose. If I make something like jump physics false, then the player just won't be able to jump. If I make the walk animation boolean false, the game won't ever play the walk animation until I explicitly tell it to. This probably isn't the smartest way to go about things, but I feel this will cause the least amount of headaches for me later down the line. Now that that's out of the way, let's really start getting this guy to move and jump. We call the physics process function, which is a built-in function that runs itself once every physics frame. A physics frame is different from a normal frame because it doesn't depend on how many frames a computer displays per second. So it's perfect for Sonic's physics controller. And every frame, if the player is pressing the right arrow key on a keyboard and the move physics boolean is true, the velocity on the x-axis of the character moves towards this equation. The amount moves from the last velocity x of the last frame to max speed, multiplied by the max speed float, multiplied by the direction variable, which is usually a 1 or a minus 1 to make max speed work in either direction. And each frame, it'll advance by the acceleration variable times the acceleration float times delta. Delta is a very important built-in variable that helps us make our game logic not depend on the frame rate of the computer, and a lot of the games you play probably use delta. We add this for the other direction, and then if the player is not holding left or right, then the velocity x moves towards zero, and each frame velocity x will advance by the deceleration variable times the deceleration float times delta. And that's enough for very basic movement. Now, on to animation. You see, just because we've made walking and running physics-wise doesn't mean the animations will work along with it. We have to make the animations link up with the movement. So completely separately from physics, we have animations. And the main way we handle different animations playing is with if statements. We already used if statements for movement, but if statements are conditional gates that only execute certain code when a condition is met, which I can set. This is a very simplified explanation, but I've talked about basic coding principles long enough and we've barely made progress for this video. So if the player is standing still, then the idle animation plays. If he's moving from zero towards his max speed, then the walking animation will play. And as Sonic reaches his maximum speed, he'll play his run animation. The way I've set it up, it also works in reverse. So if I let go, he'll go from run to walk and then back to idle. Since the animations when we were importing them was really slow, I wanted them to speed up as the player sped up to make the character feel like they're moving while having it feel fluid. So I added some code to make it so that when the character is going towards their max speed, their animated sprite frame rate slowly goes towards 12 FPS. Once you reach top speed, the animation always plays at 12 FPS, and once you slow down after reaching max speed, you slowly go back to 5 FPS until you stop. After all this, I'd love to actually test my game so I can see what needs to be fixed, since at this point I hadn't done that yet. But a lot of the code in the game relies on me being on the ground, and I haven't added gravity or jumping yet, so it's high time I add that. Jumping in video games as a whole is generally easy to make. That is, of course, until you're a Sonic game. Jumping in classic Sonic has so many things to it. Your jump is also affected by how steep of a slope you're on to push you on the x-axis, jumping moving is different from ground running, and if you let go of the jump button after jumping, your y velocity gets set to minus 4 pixels per frame. And in all honesty, I'm not doing that. Now. This is a series after all, and even with everything I've said, Sonic's physics are nowhere near done, so for right now, I'll lay out the basics. Every frame, we check if the player is not on the ground, and if he isn't, then the player moves down at a set pixels per second. It keeps doing this until I find ground to stand on, and if I press the jump button and I'm on the ground, then my Y velocity just gets set to another set of pixels upwards. That's it, and the rest is handled by those two things. So finally, after 20 minutes of coding, I'm finally making a game scene to hold the player controller scene, make a basic collision to infinitely span across the x-axis so that Sonic can fall on something, and finally run the game. Hopefully all my code is stable, 
and it won't have to fix anything. Are you kidding me? Yeah, it was pretty stupid of me to code so much without even testing once. In case you didn't see the problem, I was actually holding to the left, but the sprite wouldn't flip. I checked the code that made the sprite flip, but it wasn't broken. Because you can't actually see whether I'm moving left or right, I thought I wasn't moving left. So I printed how many x velocity I have and I was turning left, but just the sprite wasn't. After a bit of debugging, I realized that when I changed the direction from 1 to minus 1, I was actually declaring another variable with the same name that was blocking the glober variable. So basically this var before the dir just ruined everything. We fixed it, and now walking, running, and jumping is done for now. So now we can move on to more detailed sonic based movements. While I was testing the game, I realized that if I was going max speed and suddenly wanted to stop, it would take quite a while to actually stop and start turning around. The obvious solution is skidding. In the real Sonic 3's code, skidding doesn't actually stop you faster, but I'm going to make it so that it does. Within the movement code, if I press a direction and the x velocity is more than 260 in that direction, you enter skid mode. In skid mode, you don't have any ground animations except the skidding animation, and you can't move left or right. The only way to escape is to either come to a full stop or jump while skidding. For normal movement, I use my decel variable, but for skidding, I use my fast decel, which is three times stronger. It isn't accurate, but I still prefer it. Skidding was pretty simple to implement, but I'm not sure it'll stay so easy from here on out. Looking was a very basic thing to add, and it wasn't even that difficult either, at least in one direction. Looking up was as simple as locking all animation and movement and creating my cam bool variable. If cam bool is 0, then the camera stays still. If it's 1, it moves upwards, and if it's 2, it moves down. So it's as easy as setting a timer, coding the camera movement, and linking it up to everything. For as easy of a task as that can sound. I still obviously ran into multiple bugs, but looking up was simple overall, but now we get into looking down. Looking down of itself is pitifully easy. Since we already made everything for looking up, all we gotta do is copy and paste the entire functionality and just replace the word up with down. That's all fine and good. But spin dashing is really complicated and requires a lot of variables. We need to make sure the player is standing still without being able to go back to the idle animation state and while charging up the animation, releasing, and everything that comes with that. Thankfully, we have a quick way to check if the player is holding down, and once the player moves down and presses the A button, you can't jump, move, or stand, all you can do is charge your spin dash. And I'd like to talk about something I found really interesting about the real Sonic 3 called Spin Decay. This is a real thing within the Sonic 3 code, and basically while you're spin dashing, you can obviously mash the A button to go faster when you release it, but what actually happens is that you add a certain amount to your spin force, and all the time the amount of force the spin dash has deteriorates towards zero, and the faster your spin dash force, the faster the decay goes. I tried the best to add it to my version, since the spin dash is not easy to create and feel like the original, but I did add spin charging and spin decay the best I could. I feel it's not perfect, but once you release the down button, you move at your max speed times spin force, but I made sure to not make it too overpowered, so at my physics engine, the most you can charge is 3 times max speed, and it takes about the same 6 taps to reach max speed. Of course, this was not bug free at all. The spin dash animation froze a lot and one of my biggest blunders was forgetting to add the run and boolean to me actually running the whole time. But now, we can move left and right with somewhat similar physics to Sonic 3, look up and down with camera movements, and spin dash with decent physics. And that's about where I want to end this video. We're still nowhere near this project being done, as even Sonic's movements are incomplete. So for the next part of the video, I'll try to work on more advanced player physics mechanics and most importantly, try to add a little UI to implement switching between Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles on the fly. Well, that's all from me today. 
Have a good day or night wherever you are. And if you enjoyed this video, you're a freaking nerd.